I think my name is Gunnar Clovis. I'm the vice chair for the board of directors of the IGDA Las Vegas. Uh, we run events here at the Innovation Switch, um, community events for tech growth in Vegas, specifically game development, every month. Um, this January is a bit more packed than normal. This is kind of a bonus session that we did. Uh, this is a lot smaller than our normal stuff, uh, cozier, one might argue. That's a video game reference. Um, so yeah, this is going to be fairly uh, relaxed. This is our first attempt at a technical workshop. So this is going to be fairly uh, programmer focused. I'm expecting a few more people to trickle in, but uh, yeah, this is my friend Justin Terry. He's going to control everything and do a great presentation. Okay. Hi, so my name is Justin. Uh, I can go to the first slide. Um, I work at Human Ed Studios. Uh, they're based out of Madison. Uh, currently working on Rune, which is a open world RPG like Viking game that we've been developing for a little over a year, which is about how long I've been at Human Head. Before that, I was a back end web developer for three years, and I got my degree in game programming from Columbia College Chicago. So I've been doing freelance web development on the side and primarily working at Human Head for the past year and a half. A little bit more about Human Head itself. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Human Head, they were founded in 1997 by some ex-Raven software employees. Raven still exists in Middleton, Wisconsin. They're, there we go. Uh, they are primarily based working on Call of Duty or AAA Studio. They've always been kind of a bigger uh, studio. So six Raven software employees went to a warehouse in the middle of Madison, started making games, made some really successful IPs, started with Rune, that was their first. They Transition to Prey, which a lot of people are more familiar with than Rune. They lost the contract with Bethesda for Prey 2 close to the end of development, which is a hotly contested thing. And that eventually resurfaced as the Prey we know from, uh, I think it's Arcane Studios. And so that's what they're most known for. They've also done a lot of contract work on bigger games like Bioshock, uh, Batman, Just Cause 3, a whole other things. Uh, currently working on Call of Duty Online. And then right now, we're primarily focused on the sequel to Rune, which I'm working on. We just launched Survive By, which is a MMO bullet hell RPG. It just came out like a month ago. It's been in beta for a while. That's pretty cool. They're working with Digital Extremes on that one. They made Warframe. And some other unannounced titles in the works. So. I'm here to talk about tonight is starting a game. And just by a show of hands, how many people have started a game before? So most everyone. And a lot of the things that happen when you start a video game is you have this really great idea, you have this really exciting premise, you have this mechanic, you have this hook that you really want to get into the world. You want to show it off. And a lot of times that can spiral out of control, the scope can grow out of proportion, it can do a whole bunch of things. And this talk is primarily focused on trying to avoid that scope creep, but also managing the scope in a way that if it does grow out of proportion and you do get carried away, how can you architect the software to respond to that? Be modular, be adaptable to new ideas and new iterations on your existing thing as they come up, which they inevitably do. The scope changes, the idea shifts. You realize maybe that wasn't as fun of a mechanic at first, but you now have the second idea that you want to incorporate that makes it better. So when you're starting off, we have a few points up there. Uh, you're focusing on gameplay mechanics. What is the player going to be doing? What are they going to be primarily based on, focused on? Um, what's fun? what's gonna be exciting for the player, what's gonna be compelling. Um, a lot of times, what you initially start out to make may seem good on paper, and as soon as you start implementing features, it's boring, it's repetitive, it can get sort of mundane, and you're thinking, all right, well, 
how can I spruce this up? What part of the original idea felt good, so good enough that you could justify spending your free time or your, you know, sleeping hours working on this project in the spare time? Um, what's the art look like? What's what's fun about this? What's gonna pop? What's gonna make people see it on Steam and go, wow, that's really exciting and cool and that thumbnail really grabbed my attention because I only played Greece because it was really pretty. <laughs> and then I was pleasantly surprised when the game was actually really fun. So kind of snowballing into the art style too, what does the idea express? Where is it going? So you have this, you have this thing that you thought of. Why do people want to play it? What's going to be compelling? What are you trying to tell the player by making this game? And then all of those things have to be made really fast and iterated on to find that fun because if you don't work fast, you're going to probably lose the motivation or at least get over that hump of realizing, hey, this is maybe not so great. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen. So when you're starting off, primarily you're going to be trying to get the game working so that you can see these things, right? And from a technical standpoint, um, I was thinking a lot about Unity when I did this, but it happens in all engines. You're going to start writing some scripts that work really fast. So you're going to make a player script, and you're going to say, oh, yeah, cool. So my player's running around, my player's shooting, my player's doing all these things. Cool, I need some enemies to kill, so I'm going to make an enemy script. I'm going to make a couple things. Maybe this one runs around. Maybe this one hides behind cover. Maybe this one, you know, throws a grenade. And as you start to build those scripts, they're going to interact with each other. They're going to sort of, I don't know, they're, yeah, that one. So they're going to start to create bugs or maybe start to realize that you're interacting with things in a way that you didn't initially plan for, and it can snowball, and now you're stuck debugging things rather than starting to make a new enemy or starting to make a new weapon or whatever. So as you're starting to make those things that uh, are interacting, my instinct originally was more to, if you want the player to shoot a gun and you know, swing a sword, the player script starts getting really big, and it starts ballooning out of scope, and it starts kind of sort of uh, ballooning, yeah. And as you start doing these things, they're going to expand, and you paint yourself into a corner. So instead of that, um, why not start with the systems? Why not, instead of having these atomic interactions with things that sort of uh, compound and interact in a vacuum, if you can facilitate the logic that ends up dictating how all of these things work in the game state itself, you can start to implement things faster after those initial systems are written. So instead of writing the player in a vacuum and starting to add functions, add functionality to this player script, that's going to expand, 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 expand. And now if you want a new feature, you're adding the gun to the player script, you're adding the weapon to the player script, you're doing these things all on this giant player script, it's going to get really unwieldy. And when you decide you want competitive multiplayer, you're going to have a lot of things that are sort of <laughs> uh, already obsolete. You're going to end up rewriting a lot of code. So instead of that, you can start by making, say, uh, a system that facilitates all the weapons. And now instead of attaching the weapon to the player itself or attaching the gun to itself or, or the player, uh, you have a weapon system that's spawning these weapons and are based on data that is a little more like organized and iterable in the sense that if you want to add now a slingshot, a lot of weapons have the same parameters and that slingshot is then going to fall in line with all the rest of the weapons and you can implement on them. Uh, so yeah, um, I made this diagram. I'm gonna get out of the thing here. Um, so the instinctive thing with the UML that I wrote, uh, you have the player script. It's got all the, the fields that a player would have, health, damage, speed, weapon, movement stuff. 
uh, functions that allow them to do things like attack, run, switch weapon, pick up a weapon. And these weapon objects are sort of like, they're atomic in the sense that all of the fields that are on these weapons are parameters directly in the class. They're not, they're not really, uh, sorry, I'm losing my spot. They're, uh, they're not isolated, they're not, yeah. You're, you're gonna create a, an enumeration for what kind of weapon it is. You're gonna create these uh, values that tell you, okay, so this is gonna do this much damage, you know, all these things, but it's not organized in the sense that if I wanna change how damage is applied, every weapon is going to have a different sort of thing that it has to worry about. So with like a weapon data, something like a struct or, okay, so it, concept that I'm talking about here is the idea that you can take a weapon and break it down into its like basic components. What's the weapon gonna do? Uh, it's gonna have damage, you might have a weapon trail on it if it's swinging. The example I have right there with the blaster, I was thinking like, oh, well, I don't need a weapon trail. So over here on the left, that particle effect is a, a bullet trail maybe because the gun itself doesn't need it, but it can pass that particle effect to the bullet it's going to instantiate. So uh, you've got a box collider. You've got all these different things that are going to affect how the weapon does its thing. So if you factor them all out into a struct, or some sort of database or something that's going to encapsulate everything, you can just attach it here as weapon data, and now anywhere you access any weapon, you can access its data, and it, you know it's gonna have everything that tells it what a weapon is, and you can process it in a manager class instead of having these shoot functions and swing functions and all these things, they're still gonna be on the weapon, but you're gonna know it's a weapon and you're, the manager class is gonna have ways to handle all the types of things that that weapon's gonna do. So sort of the, for, ooh, oh, the overview of how to organize it. So that would have been a great slide to have pre that whole breakdown because it would have jogged my memory. Um, so you're gonna get a better idea quicker how the game's gonna flow. You're gonna have you're gonna have these manager classes that facilitate the interactions, and when those interactions happen, you're gonna be able to debug them, you're gonna see them because they're all happening in that manager class. You don't have this rogue weapon that's acting up and you have to trace down this beam sword and you're like, why is this beam sword acting different? Like as soon as you get into that weapon manager class in 30 seconds, you're gonna look at that and say, Oh, cool. Oh, normally it goes through this process of instantiating, doing all these things, whatever, and every weapon works except for this beam sword, and when it gets to this point, it just crashes or it fails, whatever. So it lets you get to those issues faster. And then when you want to make a new weapon, when you make a new weapon, there we go, uh, you're going to be able to just add a row in a table or you're gonna add like some data that says this weapon performs differently because it has a different box collider, or it has more damage, and it's still gonna get instantiated the same way, it's still gonna have all the same functionality. Already wrote how weapons work in a manager class, so now you just got a new weapon. So I guess the surprise was, yeah, that is going to be important. And Tina Turner is probably rolling in her grave because she saw that previous five, 10 minutes and was like, damn. So uh, how do you build your systems around data? Uh, your system should be built to interpret the data and can be changed very quickly. So by building these systems around a struct instead of Know, a couple classes, classes can do anything. They have functions, they have functionality that's gonna change, they're gonna inherit from things, it's gonna be messy. And data is just a handful of columns. It's just gonna process it the way most systems process data and you're gonna be able to move really quick. Um, from an understanding design point, 
if you tell an artist, hey, throw your particle effect in my table, or you give me these particle effects and I'll put them in our database, instead of going into Unreal or going into Unity, finding a blueprint, finding, oh yeah, it's that thing that's named prototype particle effect, but don't use this, it's gonna be broken and we're gonna change this before ship. They're gonna find that and they're gonna go, okay, so what do I do now? And you're gonna spend 15 minutes. Okay, yeah, but you then you click that drop down and then you import the asset into Unreal and you do this thing. If all you have to do is throw it in a table and the does it itself, you're gonna save a lot of headache. Um, in a similar fashion, iterating very quickly, um, all you have to do is change a column. If you decide that your box collider, if you're making a 2D game and now it's going 3D, all right, well, instead of going through and finding all of the references where, I mean, you might still have to do this, but uh, it's gonna be a lot easier to hunt down and find the references to those box colliders and change them to a 3D version and then all of your assets in that table that you're storing just get replaced with the new ones and you're done. Whereas if you're putting them in different spots, you don't have this central repository, this nervous system for your game where you can swap things out really quick. Um, and that last point, yeah, adding a column, so much easier than making a bunch of new functionality for a class that has existed for a year. Well now, oh God, how does that interact with all these things in this class? Well, it's just in your manager. You don't have to worry too much about it. Um, this is a more esoteric example. All right, well, oh, we're back, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a UI system, right? You're gonna have a bunch of widgets popping up for like a, a flow for a user that's starting your game. You're gonna have all these tooltips popping up. Press X to jump, press square to shoot your gun move around, a lot of games still kind of do that, even if it's less fun for the player. No one's gotten the memo yet that you can do it in fancier ways, but for this, uh, it kind of breaks it down. I can point it. Um, you're gonna have a bunch of data, and that data is structured, uh, in this case, it's like a table, and you've got this UI data. It's got an ID for the for finding it fast. You've got a position on the screen, you have the text that you're gonna display, you can do a whole bunch of things with style. I just have color as an example, but you can have borders, you can have images that you're gonna append to it. Maybe it's the icon for the UI, that, for the button you're gonna press. So you have this struct, you have this thing that's organized, and you have your UI manager that can just display a widget with the ID, and it goes and looks at the table. It's got all of the information to build that widget right there, waiting for it, and in your code, wherever you're implementing this, you just grab your singleton and give it an ID, and it'll put it on the screen wherever you want it to. Now all of a sudden you're scripting a first time user walking through your game, and instead of having a bunch of triggers and a bunch of things that are living in your world, when they reach a state, when they have some sort of event happen to them, you grab your UI manager and display the thing that has the ID that's probably Jam jumped for the first time, and it's gonna tell you that, oh, you can jump again by pressing X in the air. The first time they jump, you can just append this little event, and it's gonna have everything to build the UI with that knows where to put it. So much simpler than having a bunch of atomic interactions that are throwing pop-ups on the screen. Now you know when it's spawning a pop-up. Now you have this thing that can manage a queue, this manager. It's got a queue of all these things. It's not going to overlay things, you're not gonna be debugging interactions where someone jumped and sprint at the same time, sprinted for the first time very close to each other. So you have, you can run fast by holding shift and jumping by pressing the space bar, fighting each other on your screen. It's waiting for the first one to leave before the second one pops up because it knows, oh yeah, I spawned two really close to each other. Give it some time. All right, so we've gone over weapons, gone over UI, some other things that you can use, uh, quests. Quests get really, really out of control really fast, especially if you have different interactions and different things happening for the quests, like picking up an item or killing a certain number of enemies. You can drive that really quickly by having that interacts with a manager class for you. Okay. <laughs> 
so how many people here are tech oriented or tech focused in their awesome so uh, there's a couple different uh, engines you might have heard of them uh, unity unreal game makers another one I haven't messed with it much but I know it's really popular for um, beginners and they all have their own specific flavors of data management. So Unity has this thing called scriptable objects. They're relatively new, but they're really nice. Uh, they're basically structs and smaller objects that are accessible and editable at runtime, and they hold data really nice. So you can create a bunch of these things for the aforementioned type of instanced objects that you might be creating, UI, quests, weapons. And it contains it really nicely. Uh, you something kind of similar. Data tables, which are based on structs in the engine. Basically, you create a struct. You add a bunch of different types. It can be bools, integers, anywhere from even there's like class references and stuff. So you build up a struct, and then it has a static bunch of data that you define in a table that's accessible at runtime. And all it needs is a row name. So if you're going to instantiate an object or an item, you grab that row name of the item and it has all the information it needs to spawn the item. Um, aside from the very specific things in the engines themselves, you have JSON, XML, SQLite, literally anything that holds data you can use and implement in your own game. If you're familiar with JSON, just use JSON because it's gonna be way easier for you than trying to go with some proprietary thing. So uh, it's not perfect. Uh, it's not going to solve all your problems because you're still going to need to adapt your code to accommodate any drastic changes in data. However, reorganizing your code is not going to be based on interactions with objects and scripts and classes. It'll just be looking at a group of data and saying, oh, I need to handle this differently, or now it's dealing with a float instead of an int, which is much easier than the other stuff. Uh, your initial workload is going to get bigger as you see your game functioning, so you're gonna realize more things can uh, interact with different other things with data you really expect, and that can get messy and convoluted, like the last point says as well. Uh, you're always gonna have to stay on top of things regardless of whether you're organizing a bunch of classes or a bunch of data, like management and cleanliness. I mean, Clean Code is one of the most popular books on Amazon for a reason. It's really important to keep your stuff readable and concise uh, and just organizing data and doing this sort of thing is not gonna fix really ugly code. <laughs> it's just gonna maybe help you debug it a little faster and organize interactions a little more easily. So that is my pitch. I think we made it through the slides. Uh, if you guys want to talk prototyping and have a more informal discussion, I would love that because that sounds like a lot more fun than me lecturing. So thanks.